uh, I spent all of last season with you arguing for issues of Bible study, context, history, um, and all of that. And so I, you say, when are you actually going to get to David? Well, maybe today. Um, but I want you to un understand uh, the, the importance of context. And I've put a note in here somewhere. Um, there probably, in um, following World War II, was nobody on the planet who could have beat David or Dwight D. Eisenhower for president because of all that he had done. Now, uh, most, of hi most historians uh, don't really give him a lot of credit for... Um, a strong presidency, and yet I think history will prove that uh, uh, he did what all good presidents do, is stabilizing and, and creating an environment where the country could move beyond the horrors of World War II. Um, so all I'm saying is you can't appreciate uh, World War II, you can't appreciate Eisenhower's election unless you understand the context, and you can't appreciate what's going on, uh, what brings David uh, into, into focus until you understand what's going on in Israel. And that's really why I'm taking and have taken the more laborious approach um, to this. Uh, Morris and Whitcomb write, out of the confusion and turmoil of the period of the judges arises one of the greatest figures of Old Testament history. I, I agree with that, and I don't think Samuel gets enough credit. He is not a perfect guy, and we'll see that. But I don't think he gets enough credit for stabilizing Israel in a time when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And isn't it interesting that the country had more benefit, and you can do it, this, this is my opinion, but I think the country had more benefit from a strong biblical leader named Samuel than it did uh, in, the, in, the, in the mess of the morass of what's going on in trying to find a leader. And I would suggest that there is still a reason why God is calling people into his service because as Chuck Colson, and you've heard me say this, I don't think deliverance for the United States is going to arrive on Air Force One. I don't think it's in them. And so the deliverance for me is still, uh, what is that, uh, First, Second Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by name aim will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and it goes on from there, I will heal their land. Right? That's the answer. Now, we all have to elect presidents. I'm just saying Samuel is a huge figure. The prophet Samuel, his appearance at this time of religious degeneracy, think present too, and political distress was no, and this is what you need to underline, I think, if you're an underlining person, was no accident of history. God, folks, is at work. Okay? With the death of Samson, the country was disunited and leaderless. The Philistines were achieving greater strength and realizing significant victories as they directed their campaign to the east. Corruption in the priesthood and moral scandals. Does that sound like the United States to you? It sounds like re I'm reading the Wall Street Journal. I like a, I like a boisterous crowd. You, you guys, you guys... As Lincoln, you know, you, you will cut the ground. You, you do it, you know. Um, anyway, I appreciate that. Uh, da, 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 da. And the moral scandals in connection with tabernacle worship rendered the nation of Israel weak and impotent. Yeah. This was also a time of very limited prophetic influence. And so we needed, they needed, um, a guy named, named Samuel, who last week I kind of introduced you to um, through uh, Hannah, the mother. So you have in this context failure and fear, failure of the judges, birth of Samuel, ongoing struggle with the Philistines, desecration of the priesthood, failure of Saul. All of that is going to build in the context for David to, to come on the scene. The bigger, the bigger theme here, and I don't want you to miss this, so I've made a comment. The bigger theme here, beyond all of the, the details, is that the path of 
towards the monarchy for David must at some point leave the outward and the physical and be driven to the inward and the spiritual. Okay? All of this really is a historical look at, De- or at Israel's relationship with their God. How would they view their God and how would they work with their God? And so I've made this comment here that is, I think, um, important. In every age, in every age, God calls us, I think, to elevate his name and articulate um, what I call an authentic walk with him. Um, And that sometimes, that, that often doesn't look sophisticated. It doesn't look, you know, it's not always cleanly polished. But when you've been with somebody who's been walking with God, you know it. All right, so uh, my task for the day, if I can, is I want to give you about four vignettes, kind of overlapping pictures. And I'm going to do my best to go really from about 1 Samuel 7, uh, all the way to where you find David actually showing up in 16. So hang on to your hat because these are broad little vignettes, broad uh, understandings of what's going on. Um, Number one, in the midst of political instability, uh, what kind of rule will satisfy? So what you find here, as I have mentioned, on the tail end of Samson and in a period when everyone was doing what's right in their own eyes, there is a place of political instability that must be filled. And Samuel's place in Israel was to use his gifts um, to to get the nation prepared. Now, I have a mistype there, but I want you to quickly turn in your Bible over to Psalm 99, not 94. Whoever printed that didn't get it proof because he didn't have time. And, you know, that's my excuse. I'm sticking with it. Psalm 99. I want you to look at verse 5. 5 and 6. And then we'll go back to 1 Samuel. And I don't know that I'm going to get done with these notes that I've got. I'm just prompting you and prompting me that I've come to the conclusion in my life that I don't have to get done with everything that's in front of me. Is that all right? Okay. 99.5. Okay? And by the way, you do trust the scriptures, don't you? You sat here all last year... I had a student I, at Grace. I'm teaching two days a week there. You know, sometimes I wonder, is this real still worth it? <laughs> you know, is it really still worth it? Student says, aren't you Dr. Congro? I was walking through the commons, and, and I remember this young man. And he said, I just want you to know that I never forgot what you said in my class. And what I said in the class to these young men and women is that You don't have the right to be lazy about your approach to the Word of God. And he said, I never forgot that, and I've just been licensed by the GGF to preach. And I said, Mark, you can keep going for another semester. So you trust the Scriptures, right? Thank you. Five, exalt the Lord our God, and in worship at his footstool, holy is he. And then verse six, it's kind of like a reminder. Moses and Aaron were his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. In other words, Samuel, uh, even though he is not a perfect man, and you'll see that a little later in a little bit of a slice, but he is a praying man. God give us praying men and women to do the work of God. Okay? He was a he, he was Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord and guess what? He answered. Back to 1 Samuel 7, I think. So when you when you take a look at what 
what creates David? Obviously, God's sovereignty is at work, and nothing is going to thwart that. Not Saul, not Eli, not his sons, not even Samuel's uh, children who, you know, didn't quite get on board. None of that's going to thwart it. But, but here you have th this Samuel who, I think, has <laughs> a prayer practice that doesn't eliminate his shortcomings. Okay, we all have them, by the way. Okay, having a practice, a discipline of prayer does not eliminate our shortcomings, but it reminds us that walking with God is not without its challenges. Okay, now, um, according to Alfred Edersheim, who I just love to read, he says of Samuel that he was Levite, Nazarite, prophet, judge. And here's the thing, and this is why I have this quote in here. Because life is never static. You, at whatever age you are, and me, at whatever age I am, which is older, is we're, we're never static. In other words, you don't get to sit back and go, well, I've arrived spiritually, I'm done. Uh-uh. Just because we're older, we don't get to be a jerk. Okay? Right? Right? Sometimes I run into people who are older and say, well, I've earned the right to be, they don't say this, but I've earned the right to be a jerk. No. Now, we have earned the right sometimes to be cranky. Okay. But you are never static, and you and me, sitting in this place, don't have the luxury of just saying, well, I know enough of the Bible, I'm done. Now, obviously, that's not, I'm preaching to the choir because here you are. Look at this. Each phase of his outward calling, I love this, seems to have left its influence on his mind and heart. In other words, here was a growing guy, spiritually. Here was a guy that at some point, I believe, started what, what might be called, uh, you know, I know some of you are familiar, familiar with Frontier School of the Bible. Well, here's the real Frontier School of the Bible by the School of the Prophets, I think was a brainchild in many ways of Samuel. Wow. Entrepreneur. Forward thinker. And I, I like the, whole, the, the idea here. My note is that's what a nation needs, a man or a woman, so committed to growing as well as giving. In other words, so don't leave here without recognizing, I think, the value of you're never done growing. You're never done being discipled. You're never done discipling others. You're never done um, approaching the throne of God that you might have a greater delight of him and he who sits in the throne. Now, um, which brings me um, back to 1 Samuel 7, because my four vignettes suggest that the first one is, in the midst of political instability, what kind of rule will satisfy? Now, I have violated the, the preacher's thing. I don't have three points, and I don't have a poem today. I have four points and no poem. Okay? Okay. By the way, I, ha I put a quote on the board yesterday for my students from A.W. Tozer. It is doubtful that God can use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Let that one run around your head for a minute. It is doubtful that God can use a man or a woman greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Eighteen-year-olds need to hear that. We all do. Thanks for saying that. Whoever said that, <laughs> that's right. But I wasn't going to say that. Okay. And the men of kiriath Jerim came, this is 1 Samuel 7, took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. There's been a lot of difficulty here. The Philistines have walked off with the ark. It's not, you know, things are not looking well politically. Okay? That's, that's where the, the world is at. They brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark remained at kiriath Gileam, the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the houses of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now, if you know anything about lamentations, 
You know, the Lamentations are from Jeremiah, who is often called the weeping prophet. Some might consider that weakness. I consider that greatness. Because the Lamentations and the lamenting means that we are thinking about how sinful we are and how much we need God. And this country has not, is not there. Look at this, verse 3. Then Hamuel, Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all of your heart. Now that's a common Hebrew expression, but it means right down to the core. Okay? Right down to the core. The Hebrew, the Hebrew understanding of the heart is the center spot right here. In other words, the gut, where you live. Okay? If you return to the Lord with all of your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Asherah from among you, and look at this, it's intentional, and direct your hearts to the Lord. Look at that, it's just this. And uh, it's a cause and effect. If, remember that from last year? If you do this, boom. And serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And this is a wonderful, if you look at verses 7 through 13, I won't read all of those, but look at this offering. Now, the, when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mitzpah, the Lord of, uh, lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and the sons of Israel heard it. They were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry to the Lord for us that he may save us from the hands of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel and the Lord answered him. I call that influence. The term of the culture is uh, being an influencer. That's a big thing now. Oh, you can go online and be an influencer. Use somebody's product and Tell them how great it was. Well, Samuel just told the people how great God was, and he answered them. Now, all of that's great, right? Yes. But there are challenges here, as there always are. And one of those challenges, and again, I'm being very broad here. Uh, I could have made a dozen messages, uh, but we don't have time for this. This is a study on the life of David. So I'm just giving you an overview. This is the, the 30,000 feet view, okay? I've listed five problems here that I think are challenges, as there always are going to be. Number one, there is the problem always of leadership. I forget who, but the, I think the uh, one-time president of uh, Tennessee Temple, which isn't Tennessee Temple anymore, said uh, everything rises, uh, Robertson, um, Dr. Robertson, everything rises and falls on leadership. Yes. And Samuel, by the time you get over to chapter 8, is old. Oh, my word. He's old, like we all are getting. Okay? Look at this. 8, 1. And it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. Verse 3, his sons, however, did not walk in his ways. How often do we hear that? And that's why, one of the reasons I'm hanging up my shingle, because I've got 11 grandkids who need somebody to keep pushing the hammer down, gently, within parameters, of course, I am not a helicopter parent, grandparent. I am a panzer tank parent. Okay? And I know this. But the, the challenge for the culture repeatedly is passing the baton. And for those of you that are in the process, you know it ain't easy, right? But that doesn't mean you don't keep trying. Till your last breath, contend for the faith. Contend for a core walk of faith in the lives of your children and your grandchildren. And I can't promise you everything's going to turn out, but God will honor that in your life. Trust me on that one. Now, so 
is, did not walk in his ways, look at this, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Now, they weren't as bad as Eli's kids. We'll get to that. They weren't profaning the temple and, and uh, having um, debauchery outside the, the door. They weren't doing all that. But the tem- <laughs> here it comes. The temptation of greed got the best of them. As it, <laughs> you know, there's things that I can, <laughs> well, let's just say there's things that I can, that I can handle uh, and, you know, I have to sometimes say, you know, there are issues, and I'm not telling you what it, they are because, you, you, well, let's just say that, 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 that financial gain is a challenge in the ministerial world. <laughs> just put it to you that way. There's the old, my mom used to share with me the old adage from the, the preachers uh, in the old days, oh, Lord, you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. And, you know, it, my mom was so wonderful. She, she said, I have spent so many years looking at pastors. You know, she would sit down where Don and Judy are, and she would look at pastors' shoes. You know, shoes were, were a big thing for my mom. And so I always, especially when I entered the ministry, I always had a good pair of shoes because my mom said, I've spent my lifetime looking at pastors with crappy shoes. <laughs> it's a memory I have. So every time I buy a new pair of shoes, I try to remember, Mom, I'm Okay. But so I understand how this kind of stuff happens. I'm not condoning it by any means. The problem was th- these kids never, never grappled, I think, never ho- held on to what really matters. And if you're in the ministry for the money, you won't be in it long because you can make tons more other places. And frankly, that's why we can't find enough pastors in our day because it's easier to make, be an engineer and code and make six figures than it is pastor a local assembly with all the challenges that come therein, right? I'm just telling you. Um, part of the problem is pastors who do come out of the pipeline they want to go to churches with 500 and, and a huge salary, and they have no concept of what it means to grow an assembly into grace and truth. Anyway, I'll stop. I'll stop uh, meddling and get back to the text. But that's it. So the problem of leadership is always going to be a challenge. They're not guilty with sins associated with Eli's kids, but they were given to bribery and proved in here inconsistent in the work of God. So, um, and I'm talking about biblical leadership now and, and how that affects. Uh, in, the, in the midst of political instability, we don't need knuckleheads in the ministry making life worse for the rest of us who are really trying to do a good job. This woman, by the way, who killed with her new boyfriend, who killed her children because she said they were in, inherited by demons and she said the Lord was going to take care of her, needs to, to check into the local pine rest because that is, insan- that is, that is insanity. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord led me to do it. No, he didn't. So what I'm saying to you is, is that leadership is important not only for what it renders immediately, but the testimony it renders down the road. So that's one problem. And here's the second problem is envy. All right, look at verse 4, chapter 8. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Don't you love saying Ramah? I love saying Ramah, and here's another one that I love to say, Zerubbabel. Say it with me, Zerubbabel. Don't you just love to say that? It's just a cool word. Pastor Mark hasn't had enough sleep, you're saying. And they said to him, behold, <laughs> you know, this is, this is, behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. In other words, we need somebody else. Now appoint a king for us, <laughs> this is so, so practical, appoint a king for us to judge us like all the other nations. My greatest adversary growing up was a guy named Denny. Denny had everything. His mom and dad had a credit card for Sears, and anything that Denny wanted, he got. Go-karts, electric guitars. And I looked at, I looked at that and said, Mom, uh, Denny, Denny's got a go-kart. She said, you're not Denny. 
What kind of answer is that? Got nothing. Well, Denny is a spiritual dud, never married, never, no family, has nothing going for him, so my mom made the right call. We want to be like the other nations. Now, if you look, look at this, Samuel, being the spiritual guy that he is, even with problematic kids. Oh, and by the way, I need to say this. And I probably said it before. You can only beat yourself up for your children's failures and mistakes so long. When they walk out of the door and become an adult, it's on them. Okay? Don't... We all... We all feel failures as a parent. I understand that. But if you have done what God called you to do and you understand your frailty and your sinful nature and you recognize that we all could have done things better, they've turned into an adult and God is going to hold them responsible for their behavior and you can only take so much of that on yourself. Is that helpful? I hope so. Samuel and God considered a rejection of himself. Look at this. Uh, the thing, 6, verse 6, 8, 6, was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Samuel goes back to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. Boy, that's grace. That's grace in a way. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt even to this day, in that they have forsaken me, capital M, me, and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. In other words, make sure you let them know what that's going to be like. Does the term bureaucracy and um, taxation, ring a bell, <laughs> you know? Verse, or number three, there is the problem of immaturity. Uh, and I've hinted that in that text. Do you really know what you're asking for? Okay? You really know what, what you're asking for. Samuel spoke, verse 10, Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked him of a king. He said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among horsemen, and they will run before the chariot. He will appoint for himself commanders, etc., etc., some to do the plowing and the reap and the harvest, to make weapons of war and the equipment for the chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. In other words, it's going to be difficult. It ain't no free ride to the promised land. Okay? Then there's the problem of hero worship. If you look at 819, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. So... Look at this, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. We want somebody that's going to look good and be able to fight our battles for us. Hero worship. A man, and they, they, they pick one. Saul, as you know, is, is viewed as head and shoulders above every man. Okay? Okay? Interesting quote, it isn't with me originally. If David was a man after God's own heart, then Saul was a man after Israel's heart, which gives you an idea of where their heart was. Um, don't worship pastors, folks. We're frail creatures. I would love to have your respect. I would love to have your love. But don't put me on a pedestal. And don't put Swindoll on a pedestal. Don't put MacArthur on a pedestal. Don't put John Piper on a pedestal. Let them be men of God with frailties. Fact is, I don't know if you remember this, but a number of years ago, John Piper, and only Piper with a good-sized congregation, I suppose, could do this, took a year off from ministry so he could repair some of the damage apparently he had done to his wife. Amen. I applaud that. 
So, and then lastly, the problem of timing. Um, given the situation in Israel, national disunity, dissolving, a total failure of any kind of realized presence of the Lord, and with the failure of Eli and the fatigue of Samuel, it almost seems as the only remaining choice before them. In other words, we're running out of time. We've got to do something. Please don't do that. My former church in South Haven was with a pastor without two, for two years after I left. And they had a good guy as an interim. Good guy. Nice guy. Know him. Used to uh, go into that. But he, he's pastored locally. Good guy. But they just got tired and they got short-sighted. And they chose some guy who, who had, had no pastoral experience, wasn't ordained, and had never been trained as a pastor. Thought it would be a good job. So I think these are all... These, these issues are all feeding into, and I'm giving you this in some kind of detail here, they're all feeding in how God is going to bring David to the forefront, and that's going to be important down the road. Because especially when things get going poorly for David, it's what, what keeps everything together is this recognition is that God has set his plan in motion, and nothing, not Saul, not the Philistines, not Achish, not any of these people are going to stand in that way. So understand that I'm giving you this because I'm a sovereign God guy. Meaning, God knows what he's doing nationally and in your life. And he will bring it to pass. Now, that filters through with a passage that just came into my mind. Let's see if I can quote it. Um, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a w w good work in you will bring it to a point of completion. Telias. So can I encourage you to let God have your life and trust him? Sometimes it's white knuckling, right? <laughs> Holding on for dear life. All right, that's number one. I can see right now we're never going to get done with all four, but that's all right. Are you all right with that? I don't know what I'm going to do if you say no. <laughs> In the midst of spiritual inconsistency, what kind of ministry can thrive? Now, I, I'm not going to go back and I, I can pretty much sum up this, but if you look at Eli's resume, for example, um, his, I think his greatest weakness, I mean, we talked about a little bit this last week, how... How spiritually weak can you be when you assume that somebody who looks like praying is drunk instead? Um, his greatest weakness, I think, was the spiritual fitness of his two sons. Now, I'm gonna, it's going to sound like I'm talking out the other side of my mouth, but one of the challenges in ministry for me or for anyone in it is that, that somehow I don't have a family that... that discredits or destroys what God is trying to do. And so I did say to my children, look, you have a testimony to uphold, but not solely for protecting your father. How about protecting the name of God and its service in his, in his stead? So if you look at page three, they profaned the temple and its services, ugliness. It is likely that Eli was incompetent as a father and tepid, uh, at best, uh, as a priest. And I think, based on what I've said up to this point, you can kind of get that. Well, God values the heart of worship and the work we have committed him. It lies secondary to the work of preparation, contemplated and initiated in the lives who follow us. In other words, I am responsible as a leader in God's church to faithfully represent him before you. Now, because I'm old, I don't remember if I've told you this story about Dobson, but it is one that I have never forgotten. We went to the, the Focus on the Family headquarters uh, back when Colorado was a free state. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, um, and I remember listening to this video 
And Dobson gets on there and he said, you know, I was a pain as a child. And my father was an aspiring traveling evangelist. And his trajectory was like this. He was going places in the, in the evangelical world as an evangelist. He was gone a lot. And apparently James was a real pistol problem growing up. And James Dobson's mother, one day, he says, got on the phone and called her husband on the road and said, I need you here. His father came home, took a small church down the road, never had the fame that he had achieved, but the rest is history. So there is a sense, folks, where I have always cared deeply not that my children, I, I don't care if my children were perfect, and I don't care now and then if I have to scold them and tell them to be quiet. And I did. But I never had to say anything to them ever that they were discrediting the work of God, either at Robinson Baptist Church, well, not so much. That was really where they, they grew up. And I'm thankful for that. It isn't, because, it isn't great because of me. It's great because of God and great because he worked in their lives to see the need of representing Jesus Christ well. Okay? That's it. Now, they're, now, as I said, they're free to become jerks going forward. And they're not, thankfully. But anyway, so the, the re results for Israel at this point from a spiritual side, we've talked a little bit about the political side, what about the spiritual side? And that is, there is a superficial Christianity at work there at this point, I think. It flows out of a superstitious, uh, superficial priesthood. And that's why I think Samuel becomes so important here. This was a system that it aligned itself too closely with the world and too distant from God. Those two parameters matter. And I, and I think the, the, uh, the, the application here is obvious. The, the, the church of God, the, the, uh, you know, the formal, the, the church of God has, has begun to align itself too closely to what the world wants. I went by the Methodist church in Holland. We go by there every day on our way home. And they had about a 10 by 30 pride flag up in the, come on! Sorry. Don't care. There is nothing within the, 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 that, that movement that I can see that is of God. And I don't apologize for that. It's sad, though. I mean, if, if you think about the history of Methodism, Methodism, in this country, if you think about the, 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 the legacy of the Wesleys, it's a sad come. And yes, it's the more liberal arm of, of the Methodist Church. I understand that, but come on. Sorry, I'll stop meddling. But It is apparent that the chief sin against Eli was not a misappropriation of his office, but the spiritual damage done to his ministry by his son. So, vet well. <laughs> Number three, in the midst of family uncertainty, what kind of home can survive? Now, as I've mentioned at the top of this little discussion, um, the, these are overlapping. And I can't remember, I didn't write down the reference, maybe you know, and if you do, you can yell it out. But Eli and his lack of control, discipline, and physical presence. His response to their sins, according to the text, was something like, Oh no, you shouldn't do that. You need a time out. Or as I think the comedian Bill Engvall once said, uh, you don't need a timeout, you need a knockout. And I'm not advocating physical damage to children. Okay. In case this is being recorded, then I, I'm not a bad guy. But 
you know, his, oh my, this isn't good. That's my emphasis. Uh, that's all you got as a parent? And then you have Samuel's weaknesses. Was he away from home? Too? I'm just speculating. Was he away from home too much? While less devastating than Eli's son, Samuel's sons were found to be guilty of taking bribes. We find ourselves up against our weaknesses and how they will show up in the next generation. And you know what I discovered as a parent? The very things that I didn't want them to pick up from me. Oh my word, they got that. How did they get that? Um... We all have them, and I think the, the answer is not, well, the answer is glory when we're going to eliminate all those weaknesses and warts, right? That's the answer. But in the meantime, the answer is not eliminating all of our weaknesses, but being honest and, and authentic and open enough to say to those who matter to us, including our spouses, you know what? I'm just walking with God, and I'm, and I'm still under construction. And my son, after talking to an Asian student uh, that he mentors in Bloomington, huge Asian population at IU, um, the one thing that Josh was able to say to him, he said, Josh, Josh, Josh said that this young man told him that he, he, his parents are divorced. Uh, and he says, I, I, I never really understood if my parents love me or not. And Josh said, there was never a time. And we had family discussion. We, that's what we called them. Um, but he said, Josh told this young man of all 22, a brilliant young man, but is, is struggling. He said, I never, there was never a day when I didn't realize that my mom and dad loved me. And there has to be that kind of authentic, you know, <laughs> and this idea that men can't express that is ridiculous. You know, it's the old guy that uh, goes into counseling and you know, have you told your wife you love her? And he said, well, I did when I got married, and if, not, if anything changed, I'd let you know. That's not it. Whatever Eli and Sam were trying to do for the nation, some of that was eclipsed by the actions of their children that undermined the priestly work and hastened the progress toward the monarchy. Now, I understand that the monarchy was ultimately where God was going, but it doesn't mean that he did not grieve over the path getting there. Okay? Which leads me to the fourth, and we'll just start this. Um, and between Samuel 8 and 9, they come upon Saul, they like him, uh, and almost immediately he begins to show flaws to where Samuel has challenged him and ultimately Samuel has delivered the final blow and said, you know, the Spirit of God is removed from you. And we're not going to, you know, I could spend weeks on Saul and we will get to him as he unfolds into the life of David. But the, the point is, is that Saul very quickly becomes an... an um, a set of damaged goods. They've become all too apparent. Samuel has confronted Saul, relieved him of his leadership, uh, just as God has relieved him from his spirit. Saul's rule is declared dead and merely waiting for the wake. It's 1 Samuel 16. Now, here's a problem for some of us. We don't handle new things well. Right? You know? We don't handle new things well. My father used to wait for Josh to come home, not me, Josh to come home, so that he could retune my father's radio in his car because it was one of these new things and he didn't understand how to program it. Josh said, I wrote him a note, I gave him instructions, but he wants me to come fix his radio again. I said, it's okay, go fix his radio. <laughs> well, we don't handle new things well. We do. And the second thing is we don't like change, right? I don't like it. Why can't things be the way they used to be? All right? Look at 16. One. 
Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Oh man, Samuel says, I relieved him, but what are we going to do? Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else. I, I don't know how, you know, it's kind of like God speaking to, to Joshua after Moses had died. I love that. Joshua 1 says, hey, Joshua, Moses is dead. Time to move on. Okay? God says to Samuel, hey, Saul is done. Move on. Okay? Now, I'm saying that to you not because I just, I'm making that up. We're, before we quit today, at least, I'll try. Um, Samuel wasn't necessarily thinking vertically. You know, I've mentioned to you this before. Sometimes we think horizontally. We're thinking on this plane here when we need to be thinking vertically. What's going to please God, not what's going to make everything nice. So, Lord said to Samuel, how long? And the, the reason I'm emphasizing, because God emphasizes it. How long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel. You know, stop with your pity party. Get some coffee and get the horn filled. Well, I added the coffee. But I think that's what he would have done. Starbucks. Okay? <laughs> Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Bethlehemite. For, I love this, I, I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Okay. But Samuel said, <clears throat> because we pastors are always looking out for number one, Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. Because Saul is unstable. <laughs> and the Lord said, take a heifer with you. You know, the answer is always a heifer, folks. Take a heifer. You had a problem with your neighbor, take a heifer. Okay? Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, some modern scholars have suggested that David was lying or that God was setting, you know, in a, all I'm suggesting to you is, is that God gives Samuel a way to lessen the heat of the moment and do something that is both valuable and, and allows him to move under the the radar, as it were. Okay? Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So, verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city, of course, they want to know. Because when, <laughs> here's how bad things are. You're in a world where the, the, everyone does what's right in their own eyes and God's not happy, and they know God's not happy. And so all of a sudden you have the prophet show up in your town. You may, you're not old enough to remember this, nor am I, but in the old days when Billy Sunday used to come to town, bar shut down. And when Samuel comes to town, <laughs> oh no! Da, 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 da. And the elders of the city came trembling, look at that, to meet him and said, uh, do you come in peace? <laughs> I love it. He said, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, among other things. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, you have to understand David's position within his family. His brothers despised him. Because I think sometimes we often have distaste for those we know are in a better walk with God than we have. And rather than admit that, we don't like them. So as I, I, I'm just out on a limb here, I suppose, but his brothers despised him. And his father depreciated him. In fact, and I'll get to this in a minute, but the word he uses to identify David suggests an individual from the Hebrew, an individual who is small and weak. 
and not king, kingly material. Um, and so when they entered, verse 6, they, he looked at uh, Eliab and he thought, he thought, surely, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Why? Because he's, he has that look. He's the oldest. He's sharp. He wears a tie. <laughs> he has combed his hair. And he has a King James Bible. <laughs> it's got to be him. If you have a King James Bible, it's okay. I love the King James Bible. But there's a certain, there's a certain image that sometimes gets with that. So anyway. <laughs> it's got to be him. Bec and, and here's the thing. This is one of Samuel's frailties that is in all of us. He looks on the outward, and that's what's going to say here in a minute, and God doesn't. We think the most media-friendly, the most pulpit-accommodating person is the one. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for God sees not as a man sees, where a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, or at the heart. Okay. Where is it? Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. Maybe this is the one. A little shorter, but still a good guy. He can speak, write his name, he's good. And he said, uh, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by, and the Lord said, mm -mm, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Uh, David is not there. Why? Because David is not valued. He is out watching the sheep in David's dad's mind, and shame on him. He didn't value David enough to invite him to the consecration. He's his son. My children, by the way, are convinced that I like the other one better. And seriously, it's, Debbie and I now look at each other and laugh. When we go to Mickey's house, and then we go to Josh's house, Josh said, you spend more time with Mickey than you do me. I go to, Josh, I go to Daniel's house, and Daniel says, you spend more time at Josh and Mickey's than me. Be careful. How we treat our children equally. It's hard. Anyway, and at a, a 10, um, Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all of your children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. The word in the Hebrew is the smallest. Eh, he's out watching the sheep. He's out watching the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. <laughs> I love this. Because we ain't sitting down until you do. <laughs> we ain't leaving until you bring him. I love it. I love it. And uh, so he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord, and it's like, walks in the door, the light shines, if, you, if this were a movie, as it were, and Boom. Arise, anoint him, for is he. Then Samuel took the, the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of the brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went back to Ramah. Now, I'll just give you a couple things and then I've got to stop. There is really little said about David's future. And I'm not even sure that the brothers even understood or everybody that was in the room understood completely I think maybe the brothers simply thought that David was being anointed by Samuel to be, you know, into his school of the prophets. Because where does David go? Back to the sheep. And I think God was looking out for David because, as I mentioned here, it might be viewed as, as that, but... Uh, 
in deference, uh, I said, to David's present circumstances and Saul. Okay? Psalm, Samuel had almost certainly made Jesse aware of what God had in mind for his son, but that would have to wait for a while, for some time. But the thing you need to take away, and then I'm going I'm to stop and we'll kind of finish this next week, and this will give me a chance to give you some homework. I think what you, you must see is that the most valuable time for David up to this point was the time that he had spent watching those sheep in the fields and writing the likes of Psalm, or, yeah, Psalm 23. Because if you read that psalm and you get beyond the fact that we read it at all funerals and all that kind of stuff and recognize what is being said there, in fact, Derek Kinder, and I'll leave you with this. Depth and strength underlie the simplicity of this psalm. Its peace is not escape. Its contentment is not complacency. There is a readiness to face deep darkness and imminent attack. And the climax reveals a love which homes towards no material goal but to the Lord himself. I encourage you this week to read Psalm 23 through that filter. You know what? I did do it. You see, you always set people up for the worst, and then you come in and you drive home the best. You know what I gotta do? I don't know. Questions or comments? Do you like David or this study so far? All right, because if I have to go back and reforge something, we could always go back and study the Bible. No, we won't do that. All right, let's pray together then. Thank you. Father, thank you. I love this study, not because I can in any way relate to David. I know a bit of the context, and I know a bit of the story, and I know how hard it's going to become for him. But I know these next few years for him will be the time and strength that he will need. So, Father, there's a reason why our fear is that builds the character and sustains the man. And I think that's true of us, Father. It is adversity and challenge and difficulty. Unfortunately, we'd rather not have it that way. I wouldn't. That builds the character and the faithfulness of your people. Thank you, Father, for these people. They have a heart for you, a delight in your work, and a desire to remain with their um, bodies toward the task, towards the plow. And I pray that you will bless them this week, the needs that have been mentioned, that I can't even begin to articulate the detail, but that you will continue to have your hand upon this assembly for the glory of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thanks, folks.